Right, so um, thank you, Bill, for introducing me. Um, like Bill said, my name's Tegan. I'm the Conservation Projects Technician at Ontario Nature, and I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit today about the snakes found in Ontario and this protocol that we have developed uh, to monitor them. So before we begin, uh, I know you're all in Hamilton or presumably the area, but I am joining you today from uh, what is currently known as Toronto, uh, which is a land uh, that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. This is the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as well as the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Huron-Wendat Nation. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. As a settler, I am grateful for the opportunity to learn, work, and to be sharing knowledge with all of you today uh, on this land. I encourage all of you to uh, learn a little bit more about the history of the land where you are and uh, to reflect on your responsibilities to the land. So uh, let's talk about some other inhabitants of the land, um, snakes. So that's the main thing that, uh, or the first thing that I'm going to focus on today. We're gonna to go through the snakes that can be found in Ontario. Um, we're gonna learn how to identify some of the trickier ones. And then I will tell you a little bit about snake ecology and how that informed the development of our long-term monitoring protocol for snakes. And then I'll finish up with some stories and photos from uh, the field work I did in 2022. So uh, Ontario Nature, uh, who are we? Uh, we are a charitable conservation organization that was formed in 1931. Our mission is to protect wild species and wild spaces through a variety of programs, including the conservation science program, which is uh, what I work on. Uh, and con uh, the conservation science program aims to engage individuals across Ontario, as well as organizations in various projects that are uh, or have been developed for collecting wildlife observations, including the protocol that I will get to in the second half. All right, so we'll start out with some general information about snakes that can be found here in Ontario. We are really lucky to have a really high diversity of snake species. There are 26 species in Canada and 15 of them can be found in Ontario. But unfortunately, more than half of the species of snakes found in Ontario are species at risk. The uh, distribution and the diversity of snakes uh, changes a little bit across Ontario. So uh, mostly with climate, as you go further north uh, and the climate becomes colder and harsher, there are fewer species that can survive. Uh, and so you, uh, we, the diversity of snake species is lower in Northern Ontario. It's especially high in the area around uh, the Great Lakes uh, which is where we are lucky to be. And so there are lots of snakes um, for us to see. All right, so there are several snake families that are represented in Ontario. Uh, the first one that I'll talk about is uh, Colubridae, the colubrid or typical snakes. Uh, and in Ontario, this family is represented by uh, three of our largest snakes. Uh, the gray rat snake, blue racer, and eastern fox snake are the three largest snakes to be found in Ontario. Uh, this family also includes the smooth green snake, which unsurprisingly is very smooth and very green. Uh, and then on the bottom right here, we have the milk snake, um, which interestingly, uh, its name comes from an urban legend that um, these snakes would drink milk from cows because they are often found around bars, barns, sorry, um, but they are actually often found around barns because of all of the mice and other rodents that they like to eat. The next group um, that is represented in Ontario are the natricine snakes. Uh, these are all snakes that give birth to live young instead of laying eggs. Um, so in Ontario, we have uh, seven species of live bearing snakes. On the left here are the striped snakes, which we'll talk about identifying a bit later. The Eastern garter snake on the top there is the most common snake you'll find in Ontario. 
Underneath it is the butler's garter snake, which is a, a different species of garter snake that is a species at risk. Uh, and underneath that is the eastern ribbon snake. In the middle here, we have uh, more aquatic snakes. So our northern water snake and the queen snake. Northern water snakes are highly aquatic. Um, they mostly eat fish and amphibians. Uh, and they're very fast swimmers uh, versus the queen snakes are a little bit less aquatic, but they are interestingly very specialized on crayfish. So that's pretty much the only thing that they eat. And then on the right over here, we have our smaller snakes that are found in Ontario, the decays brown snake on the top, and then the red bellied snake below. Um, because they are both so small, they tend to eat uh, insects and other invertebrates. And uh, interestingly, they are both at least partly nocturnal. The next two groups um, are different groups of rear fanged snakes. So we have the Eastern hognose snake, which uh, represents the Xenodontidae um, or robust rear fanged snakes. And then the slender rear fanged snakes are represented in Ontario by uh, the northern ring-necked snake. And so, as you might expect, um, these snakes have fangs at the back of their mouths instead of in the front, which makes it very difficult for them to bite um, anything larger than their uh, preferred prey. And they're both specialists on uh, the food that they eat. Hognose snakes will eat um, toads, and ring-necked snakes are specialized on salamanders, especially red-backed salamanders. And then finally, we have family Viperidae, um, the venomous snakes, the only venomous snakes found in Ontario are the Massasauga rattlesnake. Um, although it is a venomous snake, no one in Ontario has died from a rattlesnake bite in more than 40 years. Um, at this point, we know how to deal with them. So uh, they are you know, very unlikely to bother you if you don't bother them. And if you do get bitten, you go to the hospital, you're gonna be okay. So not too much to worry about. All right, so let's get into a little bit more of the identification for some of these trickier snakes. Uh, so we'll start with snakes with stripes. So there's three species that I uh, introduced you to that all have this dark background with lighter colored stripes, uh, three stripes going down their back. Uh, usually they're yellow, sometimes more cream colored. Um, and the most common one is the Eastern garter snake, but uh, it can be hard to tell apart from two, these other two species, the butler's garter snake and Eastern ribbon snake, which are more rare and also both species at risk. So it's important to be able to tell, um, to differentiate between these species. And in order to do that, um, the most useful things to take a look at are the location, so where you find the snake, and also there are some uh, characteristics of the head of these species that uh, are useful for telling them apart. So for the location, um, butler's gardener snakes are really restricted in their range. They're only found in a few isolated areas of southwestern Ontario. So if you are outside of their range, um, that you can rule out butler's garter snakes. Similarly, for eastern ribbon snakes, they have a very specific habitat type. They'll always be found in uh, wet habitats near water. Uh, where So if you are in a very dry area and you see a striped snake, it's probably not an eastern ribbon snake. In terms of the head characteristics to keep in mind for a butler's garter snake, um, they have smaller heads than the Eastern garter snake. Uh, so you'll notice they, the head is a similar width to the body. They don't really seem to have much of a neck. And in the case of the Eastern ribbon snake, they have this very distinct white crescent in front of the eye, the arrows pointing to it there. Uh, and that is always present in ribbon snakes and not present in either of these garter snake uh, species. Now, if you still aren't sure, there are 
Also ways to tell them apart by their stripes. Um, this can be a little more difficult, but basically we count scale rows um, starting from the row of scales directly above the ventral scale. And uh, the stripes on each of these species are on different scale rows. So in Eastern garter snakes, you can see here, uh, you can see the ventral scales are the wider uh, light colored scales at the bottom. And then just above that, there's a row of darker scales, that's row one. And then on rows two and three, you can see the light stripe. On Butler's garter snakes, the stripes are instead on row three and only partially on row two, as well as partially on row four. And then on Eastern ribbon snakes, uh, these tend to have much cleaner stripes. Um, the, the contrast between them and the, the lines tend to be much cleaner and clearer. Uh, and these stripes are on scale rows three and four. So this can be sort of difficult to figure out. Um, so if you're ever not sure, uh, it's really good to take a picture uh, uh, of those scales and especially of the head, if you can, that's really useful for identification. And like all ID, the more you see these snakes, the better you get at, uh, at being able to tell them apart. So next uh, we have those two small snakes that I mentioned, the decays brown snake and the northern red-bellied snake. And these can be pretty hard to tell apart, especially when they are, uh, when you don't see their bellies. So the, they're both small snakes. Um, the red-bellied snake is somewhat smaller uh, and the decays brown snake has this gray to beige uh, to, light brown uh, background and it will have two rows of dark spots going down its back. So uh, they are not lines but uh, actually individual spots or sort of diamond shapes that uh, go down the length of the back. Whereas in red bellies you have these uh, continuous dark lines that go along their back. You'll also notice in the uh, decays brown snake, uh, these two arrows in the top photo up here are pointing out the dark bars behind the head. Those are uh, on either side of the head and dark blotches beneath the eye. So uh, those are uh, distinctive for uh, brown snakes. And when the snakes are newborns or neonates, they will tend to have a white ring around their neck. So this can be confusing. Um, red bellies also have a light color uh, on the back of their neck. It is more of a diamond shape and it stays, uh, it sticks around in the adults as well. And so uh, that's one way to tell them apart. Um, the diamond shape is different from the white ring around the neck. Uh, and of course, if you do get to see the belly of a red-bellied snake, uh, it is going to be red. Sometimes they are a bit more orange or a bit more pink, um, but usually it's fairly distinctly red. Um, so that is a very useful giveaway. All right, so the last group of snakes that will talk about uh, IDing are the blotchy snakes. And these are the larger snakes. Um, and they are also more, uh, more of them are species at risk. So it's important to be able to tell them apart. Uh, so the first one we have here is the Eastern Fox snake. Uh, as an adult, they have this very like orangey copper brown head, which is very useful for telling them apart from the other blotchy snakes. Uh, they're the only ones that have this, but it is not present in the young snakes. So uh, that makes the juveniles a little harder to tell apart uh, from the other blotchy snakes. In general, uh, Eastern fox snakes are going to have a um, yellow to brown, sometimes almost orangey background color with these very large dark blotches going down uh, the, their back alternating with smaller dark blotches along the sides. Uh, and when they are younger, they will have um, uh, slightly more brown colored blotches, not as dark blotches. And the background color tends to be a little bit lighter. Uh, 
and both of these, uh, in both the juvenile and the adult form, they have uh, keeled scales. So keeled scales both look and feel slightly rough, um, and you can usually see a ridge going down the middle of the scale. So that's important uh, to tell them apart from this snake, which is the milk snake. Uh, it's the only blotchy snake which has smooth scales. And so if you uh, do feel a, uh, a milk snake, uh, and even sometimes just by looking, you can tell that they have smooth scales. They feel much smoother than any of the other blotchy snakes. Uh, in terms of the coloration and pattern for milk snakes, as adults, they have a fairly light brown um, or sometimes gray background color, and their blotches are more brown or sometimes reddish with a dark outline. As juveniles um, and neonates, their blotches are very red, um, and the background color is usually even lighter, but they'll always have um, that dark outline around the blotches, both uh, in the young snakes and the older snakes. Uh, it's commonly re referenced, the um, a common identification um, trait that is often referenced is this Y shape on the head. It's the light colored Y shape. However, this can sometimes occur in fox snakes. You can see a similar shape on the back of the head of the juvenile fox snake here. And so it can be sort of, I don't find it to be the most consistent or most useful um, trait, but it does work sometimes. All right, so the next one is the Massasauga rattlesnake. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the only viper that we have in Ontario. And because of that, it has some very specific uh, pit viper traits. So uh, the name of pit vipers comes from them having these heat sensory pits between their eyes and their nose. There's an arrow pointing it out. It's a bit small, hard to see, um, but that um, pit gives them the ability to sense heat in their environment, which is very useful for um, finding prey. Uh, they also have vertical pupils, um, so all the rest of the snakes in Ontario will have round pupils. Uh, so if you can get close enough to see that vertical pupil, you will know that you probably don't want to get any closer. Uh, they also will have these large triangular heads. That's a viper trait as well. And of course, being rattlesnakes, they have a rattle on the end of their tail. Uh, it can sometimes be lost and the neonates or juveniles that don't always have um, a very prominent rattle. So uh, if there is no rattle, it's not necessarily 100% sure that it's not a rattlesnake. So because of that, uh, some of the other useful traits to keep in mind are that uh, rattlesnakes have very keeled scales. So you can tell even just from this photo that they are very rough looking. Uh, and their blotches, unlike the other blotchy snakes, are very distinctly saddle shaped. Uh, so they'll have those rows of dark blotches with a dark border uh, that are mostly all shaped like uh, a saddle, or to me, they kind of look like a peanut, um, but uh, that's a fairly different shape from the other blotchy snakes. They also are quite a bit thicker bodied than uh, the other blotchy snakes, especially the milk snakes and fox snakes. And the young snakes uh, for Massasaugas are quite similar to the adults. <clears throat> And the final snake that I'll talk about for this uh, identification section is the Eastern Hognose Snake, one of my favorites. Uh, this is usually a blotchy snake, but their coloration and pattern is really, really variable. So you'll sometimes get sort of solid olive green colored uh, hognose snakes. Uh, their background color can be gray, green, yellow, orange, brown, um, all sorts of different colors. And their blotches can also range from really dark to quite light in color. Uh, so that is not the most useful thing for identifying them, but they do always have uh, these two prominent dark blotches behind their eyes that are pointed out um, with the arrow in the left picture there. 
uh, and you can see it in all three of these snakes. They also have a little upturned snout, um, which is where they get their name from. Uh, they use that to burrow in the sand. Uh, and uh, they also have keeled scales. So like I said, milk snake is the only blotchy snake with smooth scales. Uh, so if you're seeing smooth scales, it's definitely a milk snake. And again, for hognose snakes, the juveniles and neonates are very similar looking to the adults, but of course, much smaller. All right, so we are going to do a little quiz. Um, I'm going to launch some polls. If you, uh, when you see it on your screen, um, feel free to answer. I encourage you all to answer and make your best guess, even if you're not sure. But we're just going to practice some of the ID skills that we just learned and um, show to me that there are actually people out there because I can't see any of you. So I'm going to launch this first poll, um, which corresponds to the uh, slide that I'm showing. So uh, let me know if you think that this is a decays brown snake, a ring necked snake, a red-bellied snake or an eastern garter snake. And I'll give you maybe 30 seconds uh, more or until everyone has participated. I see some answers coming in. That's great. It's good to know people are there. All right. Anyone else wants to put in a guess? Go for it now. Okay, well, it looks like that's all we're gonna get. So I will show you the results. 53% of you said decays brown snake and those 53% are correct. Um, I see some people thought it might be a ring neck snake or a red bellied snake, which um, can be difficult to tell apart from a decays brown snake. Does anyone want to put in the chat any traits that they uh, noticed that uh, tell them that it, uh, which species it is? Any decays brown snakes uh, traits that you want to point out? I'll start with one. I think it's the one that's probably the most confusing for this slide, uh, for this question. Is the white ring, yep, uh, Eva or Eva is uh, saying, yep, okay, a few of you. So uh, great, thank you. Okay, awesome. So yes, we're seeing this white ring around the snake, uh, uh, around the neck of the snake. Um, because this is such a small snake, uh, you might have guessed that it's a neonate. And so that is why it has that white ring around the neck. So it's not a ring necked snake, which usually has more of a uh, yellow neck uh, ring around the neck and also has no spots or stripes going down its back. So I'm seeing people saying dots rather than lines going down the back. That's great. That is a decays brown snake um, trait. Uh, Bruce pointed out the black marks around the eye. That's also correct. Uh, there's a black mark behind at the back of the head and one under the eye. And lots of people are saying um, the dots going down the back. So that's great. Um, good job, everyone. If you have any questions about uh, the species uh, that we're, that we're going to um, identify together, um, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A, and I can explain if you're still confused about the idea of any of these snakes. All right, we're gonna to go to the next one. So that was a decays brown snake. What about this one? I'm going to launch um, the poll in just a second. All right, let me know what species you think this one is. Uh, and so the options are decays brown snake, ring necked snake, red bellied snake, or Eastern garter snake. All right, this one seems like it's maybe a bit easier based on the answers that I'm getting. I'll give you a few more seconds to put in your answers. All right, I'm gonna close the poll now. 
So 97% of you guessed red-bellied snake. That is correct. Um, I, if you want to share the traits that you notice that are red belly traits in the chat, I'm seeing uh, right away red belly. Yep, that's a pretty good giveaway. Uh, does anyone notice anything else that uh, told you that it might be a red bellied snake if you couldn't see the belly? I'm noticing um, the stripes down the back, they're not super pronounced. This is also a neonate. Um, there's also this diamond shaped, yep, so no ring around the neck, but there is a diamond shape, uh, a light colored diamond shape on the back of the neck. Uh, and that is the red belly trait as opposed to that lighter colored ring uh, is found either in Dictae's brown snake neonates or uh, in ring neck. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, tell, oh, give me a second to launch this poll. Okay, here we go. What do we think this species is? The options are gray rat snake, milk snake, massasauga, eastern fox snake, or eastern hog-nosed snake. This one's a little tricky because of the uh, angle of the photo. I wanted to really test you all, so we'll see. We'll see how we do. I'll give you a few more seconds to put in your answer. You can guess if you're not sure. Um, you don't have to answer if you don't want to. All right, let's. And this, I'm gonna show you the results before I tell you what is correct. So we've got a bit more of a mixed uh, result here. So a few people have said milk snake, a few fox snake, um, and um, uh, the, the most popular answer here is hognose snake. One person said massasauga. Does anyone wanna put in the chat what they think? Uh, what they think the traits are? Interesting, okay, so we're seeing a Y shape on the head. Um, uh, Jerry's saying, I have a pet Western hog and it's the stout body shape that gives it away. That's an astute uh, um, observation and maybe a, a gives you a leg up. <laughs> uh, looks like it has an upturned snout, okay. So I'll address the Y shape on the head. Um, what I think you're seeing is uh, actually the opposite direction from the Y shape that you would see on a milk snake or a uh, fox snake, uh, but mostly in a milk snake. Uh, the Y shape uh, has uh, on a milk snake has the two arms of the Y pointing towards the tip of the nose. Um, and so the shape on the on the back of this uh, snake's head is not um, not a, what I would consider a Y shape. Um, the people who have noted the upturned snout and the stout body shape are correct. Uh, it is a hog nose snake. It's a neonate, um, which makes it, I think, a little trickier. Uh, and it can be hard in, in this this. Um, photo. Oh, am I zooming in for everyone? Maybe that's a little more helpful. Um, another thing that I'll point out, there are blotches going down the back of this snake, but um, right at the back of the head, there's a very dark blotch, and there's one on the other side as well that isn't as visible, and so that's a, a characteristic of um, the hognose snake and also the keeled scales. That's a bit harder to tell from a photo, um, but yes. Um, all right, that was a tricky one. We got a couple more. Also, not getting much easier. So <laughs> we're gonna really test your knowledge. I'm gonna end this poll and start the next one. So I will try and zoom in on this for you. I'm not sure if it's working for everyone, but 
what species do we think this one is? All right, we'll have a few more seconds, so get your answers in. All right, I'm going to end it now. So the majority of you said milk snake. Um, a few said fox snake and a couple said rat snake. Uh, feel free to share in the chat why your what your uh, reasoning is. So Bruce is pointing out that a young milk snake would have red blot blotches. That's absolutely correct. So based on the hand in this photo, you might be able to um, uh, guess that it is a younger snake. Now, what's a little bit tricky about this snake is that um, although the blotches are not very bright, we've got dark outlines on them and they are slightly reddish. So on a fox snake, you would have more of a brown um, spot uh, of blotches and less of the dark outline. So it is in fact a young uh, milk snake. Uh, so that's one example of how tricky it can be to tell apart a fox snake and a milk snake. Um, another thing that would be useful is if you could actually feel this snake, you would uh, be able to tell just how smooth it is. Uh, and that really gives away that it's definitely a milk snake. Okay, last one. I will launch this poll. What species do we think this snake is? This is also a tricky one. And so the options here are gray rat snake, milk snake, massasauga, eastern fox snake, and eastern hognose snake. Give you a few more seconds. All right, uh, last call, put in your answers if you have one. Okay, so here are the results. We had a little more than half guessing Eastern Fox Snake. We had some people think it was a massasauga and some say gray rat snake. Um, this is, oh, I didn't zoom in. I should have probably done that. Um, this is a tricky one because the blotching pattern on this snake is so unusual. Uh, it is in fact a fox snake. And some things that I'll point out, um, we, feel free to throw your uh, reasoning in the chat. Uh, I'm gonna point out that the blotches on this snake, um, especially on the tail, uh, the part of the tail that's curved towards the head, are very like sort of square or roundish shaped. They're not, um, they are not uh, saddle shaped like a massasauga. Also, a massasauga of this length would probably be quite a bit chunkier, um, although that's something that you just learn through experience of seeing them. Uh, Eva says it has an orange tinge. Uh, especially around the head, you can start to see it's developing a bit of that copper color on the head and the background color has a bit of an orange tinge as well. And um, the blotches have a very faint, um, if uh, any dark outline at all. So um, good job, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, I hope that was fun for you all. It was nice for me to get to interact with you. Uh, and now we'll move on to some more general stuff about snakes and the protocol that um, we are using for the project that we are working on. So let me just make sure I don't still have that poll open. Here we go. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about 
uh, what all of these snakes have in common now that we have learned about all the diversity of snakes in Ontario. Uh, so all of these snakes are ectotherms and uh, because of that, or what that means is that they can only change their body temperature through behavior. So they have to uh, move from one location to another uh, and uh, use the uh, natural features of their environment in order to control their temperature. So for example, they might bask in the sun to warm up or move into a warmer area or more, more open habitat. Uh, when they need to warm up and then move into a shadier or cooler habitat when they need to cool down. This is really important for understanding snake behavior because uh, it means that a lot of what they do is driven by environmental conditions. And so generally speaking, uh, in the big, uh, the big scale, um, snakes are hibernating in the winter. Uh, when it's cold. And then in the early spring, as it starts to warm up, they will emerge from their hibernation spots or hibernacula and uh, focus on warming up and regaining energy after the long winter. So they'll spend a lot of time basking. They'll be looking for food to uh, get their energy up. And uh, they will also um, uh, yeah, sorry. And, and then as the temperatures start to cool down in or continue to warm up throughout the spring and into the summer, uh, they will start to disperse further from uh, where they were hibernating, looking for better habitats for foraging, for mating. Uh, and uh, they may also go back underground if it gets really hot. And then as it starts to cool down in the fall, they'll return to their hibernacula. And these snakes, uh, sorry, snakes in general, follow a similar pattern throughout the day, so on a smaller scale. Uh, so other than the nocturnal ones, uh, usually they are spending the night when it's cold, under cover or um, in warmer areas. And then in the morning, as the sun is rising, they will start to emerge, bask in the sun, warm up. Uh, and then disperse later in the day to look for food uh, or for mates or do other uh, important things like that. And then at the end of the day, as it gets cold again, they will return to uh, some nice protected spots that offer warmth and protection from predators. So this is really important stuff to keep in mind when uh, you are looking for snakes or planning a protocol that uh, has the goal of finding snakes. Another important thing to keep in mind is the what habitats snakes use. And so for the most part, snakes prefer open areas and especially edge habitats. So an edge habitat is an area where two different habitat types, uh, usually in a more open habitat and a more closed habitat, um, meet each other. And these are really useful because they offer a diversity of temperatures, um, and food and basking options uh, to the snakes. Uh, and this, they're especially important in the early season uh, when snakes are trying to bask a lot and need to warm up more. Now within these habitats, snakes also use a lot of cover objects. So I mentioned before that at night, uh, they will often go uh, somewhere that is warmer and more protected. And so these include uh, both natural and artificial objects in the environment that, um, uh, that they can take shelter under. Uh, so in terms of natural objects, it might be uh, downed branches or rocks or even shrubs or uh, grassy hummocks. And then in terms of artificial cover objects, it's things like tin, plywood, uh, even tarps that might be left out in a field. Uh, these are really good uh, objects that provide both uh, opportunity for thermoregulation and protection from predators. So snakes tend to use them when it's cold and also when they are shedding or um, other like injured or, or uh, otherwise need protection from predators. Uh, need a safe place to hunker down. And of course, it's important to keep in mind that uh, 
a vast majority or a lot of the snakes, more than half of the snakes in Ontario are species at risk. They face a lot of threats. Uh, in Southern Ontario, especially uh, habitat loss and fragmentation and road mortality are really important threats for snakes. Uh, there's also persecution due to fear and misunderstanding of snakes and poaching for the pet trade, as well as disease that is spreading within snake populations. And so because of all these threats, it's really important um, that we make some conservation actions uh, towards protecting these species. But snakes are cryptic and there's a lack of information on general baseline population uh, trends for uh, the, a lot of these species, both the species that are at risk and the more common species. So uh, we really need that baseline data in order to, um, for COSIWIC, the Committee on, status, on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, to assess species and uh, also to figure out what conservation actions are useful. And because of this need for uh, standardized, widespread, and long-term monitoring uh, in order to get that baseline information, Ontario Nature developed this long-term monitoring protocol that I am about to tell you about. Uh, and uh, it was developed in 2017 with a group of experts and uh, conservation professionals, a bunch of really great people. Uh, and then piloted in 2018. And since 2019, data has been collected annually at um, now we have over 40 sites. Uh, so because, uh, so, so here is a map uh, of those sites. Uh, currently there are 42 sites set up across Ontario. Mostly it is Southern Ontario, although we do go as far North as Killarney Provincial Park. And uh, we wouldn't be able to monitor such a wide area, so many different habitat types, if it wasn't for all of our wonderful partners who are helping us uh, to conduct surveys. And so at each of these sites, there is a transect of plywood boards set up. So I mentioned those artificial cover boards, uh, or artificial cover objects that are really useful for um, snakes, they're useful habitat for snakes. And so uh, each of our sites has a transect made up of 24 plywood boards that are spaced in a line five meters apart uh, that all fall within one habitat type, ideally a habitat that is good for snakes. Uh, and these transects are set up in full sun, uh, so they get nice and warm uh, for the snakes to uh, be able to use them to warm up. And ideally they should be set up uh, the fall preceding surveying, although at a minimum it should be two weeks prior to the beginning of monitoring. Uh, and this is because the longer the boards stay in the natural environment, the more they sort of become a part of it. And that makes them more attractive to snakes. So when picking a site, as I said, we do need to keep in mind habitat type, um, those good habitats for snakes that I was telling you about before are um, good candidates. So anything that is an open or edge habitat is great. Things like uh, forest clearings or forest edges, open canopy swamps, marshes, alvars, dunes, savannas, meadows, prairies, all of these are really great um, habitat types to set uh, to use this protocol in. Uh, it's also good to keep in mind whether or not snakes have already been observed in an area. So uh, candidate sites that have recent snake observations, especially species at risk snakes, um, are really good options for our protocol uh, because then you already know that there are snakes there and there's a higher chance that you will get uh, snakes using the cover boards as um, cover objects. And then it's also important to keep in mind accessibility of the sites. So is it private uh, land? Do we need landowner permission? Uh, we need permits for our, um, to conduct our surveys and to handle the snakes. And also just, is it uh, possible to access, um, sorry, I'm losing my spot here, uh, to access the sites. <clears throat> 
Uh, so then the next thing that we do in uh, the methodology of our protocol is to decide when we will start surveys. So uh, as I said, snakes are starting to emerge from their hibernation spots um, in early spring or yeah, as it starts to warm up. And so usually that's between mid-April and mid-May, depending on where you are in Ontario. And uh, Based on the region of the, the site, uh, we pick a date and then that's when the first survey will occur. Usually you want to be within these, this temperature range because uh, that is when snakes are most likely to be uh, starting to emerge. And then all of the sites conduct uh, ideally eight surveys every five to nine days. So this is supposed to cover a 76 day period in spring and into early summer that uh, is the most likely time to capture as many snakes as possible. We also have guidelines in the protocol for uh, the weather and the time of day to conduct surveys themselves. So we want uh, the temperature uh, and the other weather uh, conditions to be favorable for snakes to be under the board. Uh, so usually that's air temperatures between 10 and 28 degrees Celsius, not too windy, no rain. Uh, and these are just to maximize our chances of finding snakes. Uh, and also even more important is to be consistent across all of our sites with our protocol. And so we set a, a time guideline. All of our surveys are done within the, a two hour window after sunrise or before sunset. And this is just to catch snakes when they will actually be using cover objects. So in the mornings uh, and in the evenings is when snakes are most likely to be undercover um, before they are out in the habitat um, foraging or basking later in the day or in the middle of the day. And then the next thing is actually going out and collecting the data. So uh, each of our surveys starts with uh, measuring uh, and recording weather variables. So we record temperature, wind, precipitation, cloud cover, for each survey. We also keep track of the survey effort. So we record with a stopwatch how long we actually spend looking for snakes, which is important for our analysis down the line. And basically what you do is you go along the transect of cover boards, you lift them up one by one, look for snakes, feel around in the vegetation with your hands because they can be hard to spot. In this bottom left picture here, uh, the circles, there is at least one snake in each of those circles. Um, if you can spot them, I'll be very impressed. Um, sorry. Uh, and uh, when you find snakes, we uh, record the number of snakes and what species they each are. Uh, and then for any species at risk, we also like to take photos so that we can identify the age and the sex of the um, snakes. And that is for uh, a future analysis, hopefully, to be able to determine an, a population estimate, um, an estimate of the population size for the species at risk. And then on top of surveying for snakes, we also do habitat surveys on the fourth visit to every site. This is just a high level um, a, a record of the vegetation at each site so that we have a good idea of the types of habitats that we are surveying and uh, to know any disturbances over time. So with all of that methodology, um, our goal is to monitor uh, as many sites across Ontario as we can over a long time period, hopefully 10 years, uh, in order to be able to gather some of that baseline data that we need for uh, a better understanding of these snake species. Uh, hopefully we will, be, we will have enough data to be able to detect population trends and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have enough partners. Uh, we already have, like I said, 42 sites, but we're hoping to expand even more uh, to, uh, to gather as much data as possible in a standardized way uh, so that we can generate some really good information and address those knowledge gaps.
All right, so now I'll do a little bit of fun uh, photos and stories from the field season uh, in 2022, uh, doing this long-term monitoring protocol, which is what I was doing all summer. Uh, so this snake right here that you're seeing is a young fox snake. It's actually the first species at risk that uh, we captured this year. Uh, and interestingly enough, we captured it four times throughout the season. So you can see uh, it's a little bit hard to tell because of the scale of these photos, but we got to see this snake growing and changing over the season, which was really cool. Uh, you can sort of tell in this top right photo here, um, the snake looks a bit more dull in coloration than the other photos, especially the lower one. That's because um, the snake was shedding at the time of the, uh, the June 10th observation or about to go into shed. And so uh, it had older scales that were about to come off. Um, so that was really interesting to see the, the change in coloration as they are shedding. And then after they shed, they tend to be much brighter. All right, the next one I'll tell you about is uh, this lovely adult milk snake that uh, we found also on the same uh, trip as uh, the previous snake that I showed you. This is a snake that was captured for the first time in 2021 and then recaptured in 2022. So hopefully you can tell here how much bigger it grew over the, the year. Uh, between captures. So that was cool to see. It's always exciting to know that the snakes are still out there uh, doing well um, and uh, and growing and <laughs> it's cool to cool to see them again. Uh, so here's a picture of me with this snake um, and a, a picture of it with its tongue out. It's kind of cute. Um, and then this guy was a really exciting find. Um, a very large adult fox snake, which um, we almost didn't see, surprisingly enough. Uh, we were looking under a cover board, my coworker Brittany and I, here she is with this snake, and uh, there were no snakes under it. And then Brittany saw out of the corner of her eye some blotches, and she looked over and she pointed at my foot and sort of curled around my boot um, was this really large fox snake, um, almost as if it had moved out of the way just as I had stepped. Um, so that shows you just how hard they can be to spot. Um, they've got really great camouflage. And um, yeah, I had to grab it. It was very big, quite intimidating, uh, almost about four feet long. Um, so that was the biggest snake we found this year. Here's some couple more pictures of it. Um, it was a really lovely snake. The fox snakes are very gentle, um, really one of my favorites. And then the last story I'll share with you as we come to the end uh, are these uh, juvenile or actually neonate hognose snakes that we found. So there were two of them, this guy and this little one. Um, it was at the very end of the season. We hadn't found any hognose snakes yet um, this year. And uh, we came across both of these little neonate hognose. Um, the first neonate hognose snakes we've ever found under the, and under cover boards with this protocol. So that was also really exciting. And they are just so cute with their little upturned snouts. Um, they put on a whole display for us too, spreading out their necks to make themselves look bigger. Uh, and a fun thing that these uh, snakes do is they will sometimes play dead. So uh, both of these snakes actually flopped over onto their backs and stuck their tongues out, uh, pretended to be dead. Uh, and this is a defense mechanism to avoid being eaten, uh, but they are very much still alive. Um, you can flip them back onto their bellies and they'll lie back down on their backs. Um, it's very cool to see. So that was um, really exciting. And I had a really great field season doing uh, work on this protocol. Um, and if any of you as individuals or organizations are interested in getting involved with this project, uh, like I said, we're still looking for more partners. Um, I put Brittany, my supervisor's email uh, at the bottom here. Feel free to reach out, um, even just to say you're interested and we'll be in touch with more information. 
um, these are some skills that are really useful to have, but hopefully we will have another, we've done training events in the past and hopefully we'll have another one um, sometime soon. So uh, you can always come to that if it happens uh, to, to learn how the protocol works in person. Uh, so I just, I need to thank the project partners at the top here. We have all of the wonderful um, experts who uh, helped us develop this protocol. And then in the middle here are all the organizations uh, we are working with and private landowners as well to do those surveys. And of course, my fellow Ontario Nature staff who work on this project, mostly, uh, especially Brittany, she leads it, uh, as well as Alyssa and Samira. And of course, uh, we owe many thanks to all of the organizations that have funded us and provided financial support for the duration of this project. Do you have any questions? Uh, I will take questions now about anything uh, and everything. Um, well, should that, I... Thanks, Tegan, that was, that was excellent. Bill, should I stop sharing my screen or do I can keep it up in case I, uh, I don't, might be useful? I mean, I don't see the need to stop sharing. I mean, you've got a nice okay. photo there, so. Um, <laughs> All right. And we can do everything, answer the questions from the screen, so. Okay. Um, um, I must compliment you on the excellent photos that you used for identification. They were at the start of it. Um, snakes are not easy to identify. I've, I've, I've um, been identifying snakes for a number of years and there's a lot that are very tricky but the photos that you selected at the start to show the representative individuals for the species were top notch yes i, I um, am very are, lucky uh, to have access to some photos from some very excellent photographers so and i noticed joseph crowley was well represented yes and, um, <laughs> And uh, Ryan Wolf had a few photos there too. So, yeah, very good photos. Very good talk. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So we do have some questions. Um, some are comments. So I'll. Um, okay. Uh, there's a few here. So let's. Okay. First question or sort of statement was: Do you have captive breeding to bring up populations for any of the species? So we don't have any captive breeding programs. Um, what we are focusing on right now is uh, monitoring these populations that are in the wild so that we can get a good idea of how those populations are actually doing. It's possible that in the future with more information, um, captive breeding programs would be useful for these populations, but it's not something we have on the table right now. Uh, there are a couple of questions about, um, you mentioned that you were identifying or you were um, talking about the same snake from um, season to season or year to year. And, and how do you know it's the same snake? What have you, how do you, um, when you recapture them, how do you know it's the same individ individual? Yeah, so um, you you may have noticed that the snakes um, that I showed you that were recaptured were uh, fox snakes and milk snakes. Uh, those are the easiest to be able to um, identify as recaptures throughout the years because of their blotchy patterns. They don't really change as they age. Um, they get bigger, but the pattern stays the same. And so you can actually take a photo from one year uh, and compare it to a photo from the next and uh, uh, be able to tell if it's the same individual. Uh, so that, that is how we do it for most of the sites. Um, we also have done some, we have other permits that allow us to do uh, pit tagging on certain snakes, um, which is how we, uh, at Ontario Nature, the sites that we survey, um, can also identify, uh, recaps. Okay. Um, one question here, I've wondered about this too. Uh, has the increase in wild turkeys affected the population of snakes, at least that you can tell? It's something that I know is being uh, researched on Peely Island um, with the blue racers. I, we, I don't know. Um, we aren't doing any research on the effect of wild turkeys on 
uh, on the snake populations. Uh, we don't have any anything in our protocol for uh, to look at that. Um, it would be interesting to know, um, but I I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know enough about uh, the effects of wild turkeys personally. Um, but it would be very interesting to know how they are uh, affecting snake populations. Okay. And um, a person asked, uh, they said they'd be very, inter very interested to help volunteer. Who do I reach out to? Um, so I'll put it in the chat so you can um, uh, hopefully copy that. I'm not sure if you will be able to, ontarianature.org. And it's also, um, so that is Brittany, my supervisor's uh, email address that I've just put in the chat. You can also see my email address on the slide. Um, you can reach out to either of us if you are interested in um, volunteering. Uh, there are some people who already have Transex set up who may uh, benefit from help from volunteers if we aren't setting up any new Transex with you. Um, so that's another way to participate. Uh, but also, yeah, if you if you have a site that you're interested in in using for uh, to monitor, um, we're also would be we would also be thrilled uh, to know about that. So, yes, you can reach out to Brittany or you can reach out to me. Okay. Um, yeah. And we have uh, several comments about the presentation. I'll just read them off. Uh, great presentation. Uh, thanks, Tegan. I, another one, I really enjoyed your presentation. So informative and interesting, great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, Pam, excellent, thank you. Uh, Ina, thank you, great info. Excellent presentation, learned so much, thank you. Uh, I have a question here, are the blue racer and the queen snake the most endangered in Ontario? Um, I believe their status is the um, highest. So let me just, I will share a link that I think will be useful. Um, give me one second. I will pull it up. So um, we have these really wonderful species profiles um, on our website. Let me see if I can find the chat again. Um, which have a lot of information. I wanted to share this anyways with the, uh, a lot of information about the various uh, uh, reptile and amphibian species in Ontario. Um, and it also talks about uh, the uh, um, status. Sorry, I'm having some technical technological struggles here for a second. Um, it also mentions the, uh, the status of each species. And so I, uh, believe that the blue racer and the queen snake are both uh, listed as endangered. Um, I'm trying to remember if any of the others are, but I think the other species at risk we have in Ontario are all threatened uh, or listed as threatened. It's kind of hard to say. Um, I mean, by that standard, yes, they are the most endangered. Um, but again, we still need a lot more information. There are some species that we don't know enough about to be able to say how, how at risk they are. Yeah. Lost my um, There was a question here about um, uh, field guides to Ontario snakes. Uh, is there a good field guide for Ontario snakes? Yeah, so um, so we do have those online um, guides that I, I just shared the link for in the chat. I also highly recommend this one. Um, it is um, probably mirrored for you, so I'll put the name in the chat as well. Uh, it's Photo Field Guide to the Reptiles and Amphibians of Ontario. Um, it was made, I believe, by the St. Thomas Field Naturalist Club. They have a bunch of really wonderful field guides. Um, and this one has not just snakes, but also other all the other reptiles and amphibians in Ontario. Um, so I would really, really recommend that. Uh, it's a great resource. Um, uh, and also, if you are looking for uh, 
uh, um, more photos. Uh, we have a lot of photos and more information about the snakes on that uh, web page that I just sent in the chat. But I'll put the title of the, the book in chat too. There was also a book, and this is probably, um, could be a 40 or 50 year old book called The Snakes of Ontario by Barbara Froome. Um, I don't know. I doubt oh, it's Snakes still of Ontario. Uh, I think I. I think I know the one. Um, it's. I doubt, I doubt it's in book. print. No, it's. I don't think it's a big book. No. Oh, okay. It must be a different one. Um, there may be multiple books out there called Snakes of Ontario. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, yes, and I'm. Not, I can't. I can't think of the author right now. But there is a. Uh, it's not great mm -hmm. for a field as a field guide, but there are lots of books out there with lots of information about snakes. Yeah, yeah. The problem with the um, Peterson guides is that they cover a huge range, and snakes are so variable with different subspecies that um, yeah, an Ontario guide is is quite nice to have because it shows the the snake species as they would look in Ontario. Yeah, like it's. In, it's really great. This this one is specific to Ontario. Um, the one is that I put the in Saint the Thomas. Is that the Saint Thomas Field yeah, Naturalist it is. one? Yeah. It's the Saint Thomas Field Naturalist uh, one. It's a really really wonderful field guide. So I would recommend that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, a few more questions. Okay. So uh, Jerry said, I read that book and still have a copy. Uh, the Froom, uh, Jerry's written the Frum book is excellent. It's not Barbara Frum, it's Barbara Froom. Uh, that, Jerry says that book is excellent if you can still get it. Um, Barbara Frum might have known a fair bit of, about snakes, but it was Barbara Froom who wrote, wrote the book. Uh, I'm not trying to be funny here. This, <laughs> that's, okay. All right, so um, there's a question that I, okay. Okay, so that was, uh, Paul Paul had the same question as someone else about how you, how do you know that you're catching the same snake? So you've answered that fairly well. Do you do any tagging at all? Um, myself personally, or, well, oh. I mean, I, I actually have, yes. Um, and we do with the protocol, so I, I was, um, I did mention we do pit tagging, um, but that is on a separate per, uh, permit that um, we don't have other partners do. So that's just the sites that we as Ontario Nature Monitor, um, we do uh, pit tagging for uh, snakes that it is safe to do so for um, and only for species at risk. Uh, I see, okay. Yeah. And I, I would mention when somebody was talking about uh, Blue racer and queen snake being the most endangered. Uh, the butler's garter snake has a very restricted range in Ontario. That's true. Uh, yeah, the Windsor area, and I think uh, there's still a population in the Luther Marsh. As it's so similar to uh, an eastern garter snake, I suppose it could have could occur in some other areas where it just hasn't been detected. But uh, from what is currently known, it has a very tiny range. So it, I guess it could be the most endangered snake in Ontario if yeah. the current sites that are known are the only locations where it does occur in Ontario. Yeah, so. for sure. And it's it's in yeah, it's a similar thing with the blue racers where in Ontario they're only found on Peely Island. Um mm -hmm. so uh, yes, definitely when their their habitat in Ontario is so restricted, it's hard to have uh, a lot of them and that yeah. uh yeah, it's important to protect them. The, the, the question that I overlooked, do you wear gloves to protect the snake or I would say to protect yourself from bites? <laughs> um, so we, in our protocol, we have options. Um, we do recommend wearing gloves uh, to protect the snake. Um, although we don't actually, we recommend um, uh, like nitrile gloves, not so they wouldn't really help for bites. Uh, it's mostly in order to uh, protect the snake, uh, protect the snakes from uh, snake fungal disease and other diseases that might be spread between snakes. Uh, the other option is to uh, sanitize your hands in between every snake that you handle. Um, so. Yes, we are very careful to make sure that we are not passing anything between the snakes. Uh, 
but yeah, we have options whether you are sanitizing or using gloves or both uh, is up to the, the individual.